I want to um, introduce uh, a new sermon series. We're going to be looking at a particular book of the Bible. We're going to look at a book in the Old Testament, the second book of the Bible, uh, the book of Exodus. Um, And the title of this series is this, Exodus, the Gospel in the Old Testament. And I hope you'll, uh, as we go through this, even before we finish today, you may see why that is such uh, an appropriate title, really for any book of the Old Testament, um, contains the gospel. I think all of the Bible, the Old Testament always points us to the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. But Exodus plays a very uh, important role in that. So let me start by just reading something from the New Testament um, that will kind of set the stage for us, this is our text for today, Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. If you know the book of Romans, Paul is kind of uh, uh, setting forth the doctrine of salvation so that these people who receive this letter, the church in Rome, would better understand the gospel. And right in the sixth chapter here, um, he says this, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart of to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. That's God's word for us today, and I pray that he will use it in our hearts. And we'll come back to that um, as we get through this. And we're not going to dive deeply into Exodus today, but kind of set the scene. Um, So what if I told you um, events took place um, that almost inevitably have to be made into a movie. Events like this, a people who are under uh, severe uh, and cruel bondage and oppression cry out for deliverance. A princess finds and saves a baby floating in a basket in a river and raises her as her own. A bush is on fire and yet never burns up and out of that bush the very voice of God speaks. A shepherd walks out of the wilderness to do battle with the most powerful man on earth. A powerful nation is brought. In fact, maybe one of the most powerful nations on the face of the earth is brought to its knees by natural and not so natural disasters. Slaves are set free. A mighty army is defeated. A whole nation walks through a sea with walls of water piled up on each side. Bread falls from heaven each and every morning. Water pours forth from a desert rock. A mountain covered in smoke. Now picture this scene. There is thunder, there is lightning, there is an earthquake. And the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, descends from heaven onto that mountain in fire. And he calls one man to come up on that mountain, not only to meet with him, but to receive instructions for a whole nation of people how to live as God's people. That's just the highlights of the book of Exodus. It almost begs for somebody um, to say, this is a great story that ought to be told. Um, And if you know this, um, it has been told over and over. In 1956, Cecil B. DeMille made a movie called The Ten Commandments. And it's really not just about the Ten Commandments, but about almost the whole life of Moses. Um, Many of you know that movie, either um, have have been around long enough to have seen it um, originally in 1957 and 58, but also uh, it gets replayed over and over. It's been, uh, it was reintroduced into theaters about uh, half a dozen times after its original. Um, This time of year, as we're leading up to Easter, it gets replayed um, sometimes. Now, I will tell you this, if you're going to watch it, you need to carve out some time. It's three hours and 39 minutes Um, Even by some lengthy standards today, that's a long movie. But you know Charlton Heston played the main character throughout all of uh, Exodus. He plays Moses and Yul Brynner plays um, the Pharaoh. Um, And all the things that are set forth in Exodus, um, there's a lot of faithfulness in this, you know, almost admittedly secular movie. But um, people have taken notice about the powerfulness of this story. 
And as believers and what we believe about the Bible, this just isn't the stuff of legend and fable, that this is actually the events that took place either from the hand of God in the lives of his people, and it's an extraordinary tale. And in the telling of it, this particular movie, it's not anywhere near the only one to try to tell this story, but people took notice of what a great story, and even trying to depict it took some real innovation. In fact, a man named John Fulton won an Oscar for this movie for his special effects. Now those list of things, uh, a burning bush, um, the sea being piled up, um, all those kind of things, you can imagine in 1956 what it took um, to do those things on screen. In fact, uh, it's still said that the parting of the Red Sea seen in that movie might be the greatest special effects achievement of all time in movies. Now, there are much better special effects today, obviously, but at the time, with technology that was available, it took them six months of filming on the shores of the Red Sea and in studio and lots of things in between just to get that one scene done. It was the most expensive movie ever. When you're trying to tell the story of God, it ought to take lots of innovation, lots of money, and lots of time to even pretend to get some of that Right. But here's what I like what I read most about this movie. Um, the Hollywood Reporter, which is a magazine in Hollywood that I think still exists today, in 1957 or 8, just not long after it came out, the review of this movie was pretty glowing universally. Everybody liked the actors the, and especially the special effects. But a reporter for the Hollywood Reporter, probably no real religious uh, setting of a magazine, said that if there were only one copy of this movie, People ought to make pilgrimages from all over the world to see it. In other words, he recognized that this movie depicts a story that everyone ought to see. And I think what went along with it is that they did a pretty good job in telling it. Well, here's what one Bible commentator said about the book of Exodus is its message is more dramatic than these moments and more revolutionary than the more revolutionary than these moments. So as dramatic and revolutionary it is, there's a still picture of that scene from the parting of the Red Sea, dramatic and revolutionary that God might say to us, you ain't seen nothing yet. That Exodus is only the preview of the coming attraction. Now imagine that if you went to the movie to see something, uh, a, a, a feature film, and a three hour and 39 minute preview came on um, that was only telling you how great the next movie was going to be. You might think something is strange here, but Exodus sort of fills that role for us. In fact, we would use this term. Exodus is a paradigm of salvation. That's why it's the gospel in the Old Testament is it tells the most important story, um, at least in a preview kind of way. That God is rescuing his people, and even the ways in which he does it points to the greatest rescue ever in the history of humankind is when God's own son comes to save his people. But this paradigm, if you know what a paradigm is, it is um, kind of a pattern or an example of something greater. And so we read the book of Exodus, and if you don't know the whole story of Exodus, we're going to spend some time going through much of that book, and we'll get to review some of those stories. If those highlights that I read and you go, I've heard some of those kind of things, um, we'll get into those things and say, why did God do it in this way at this time with these people? But generally, we can answer those questions this. How is it a paradigm of salvation? First, it tells a story of slaves being freed. That is a paradigm of salvation. We just read from Romans that you who once were slaves have now been set free. And as I read Romans, I think, I haven't been a slave. I've not been in jail, never been incarcerated, never been oppressed by another people. And yet Romans isn't talking about other people. It's talking about what resides in our own heart. That sin has taken hold of us in a way that we are trapped and under that kind of oppression and judgment, both physically and spiritually. I think 
Exodus should give hope to those people. In fact, in the history of this country, when there was the institution of slavery, those under the thumb of slavery looked to Exodus with great hope and great expectation that God would one day come and physically free an oppressed people. That is something that God has done often throughout history, and that was part of the salvation of his people. But more importantly, he didn't set them free just to do their own thing. He set them free so that they could be free to serve and love and worship God. In fact, we'll find that as we read through Exodus. When Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go, He doesn't say, so they can do whatever they want. He says, let my people go so that they can go into the desert and worship their God. So freedom from slavery is a paradigm of salvation, both physically but primarily spiritually. And then there's salvation by sacrifice. If you were here last week when we talked about the Lord's Supper, that Passover that took place in Egypt, the firstborn sons died unless the blood of a lamb was placed upon the doorpost. If you don't know that story, uh, I can't wait to tell it to you for the first time. In fact, I would love it if you say, I don't really know those stories in Exodus because they are fantastic to tell. And I hope they penetrate to our hearts. But salvation comes only by the shedding of blood. Not by a sacrificial lamb, but by the Lamb of God in Jesus Christ. And then there's law and love. If you don't know, Exodus is the place where God gives the Ten Commandments. In fact, on that movie poster that I showed a while ago, it shows Moses holding those tablets over his head. But the Ten Commandments aren't just rules that God tests us with. They are um, a framework for how a people of God ought to live. In fact, often the Ten Commandments are placed in two tablets. Uh, Maybe not literally on two tablets, but um, the first four commandments are how we love God, and the last six commandments are how we love each other. And so the law is given in order that we can live rightly before God, not just in our relationship vertically between us and God, but also horizontally, how we are to love one another. And there's much more of the law than just those ten things, and Exodus gives um, quite a bit of it. And then finally, maybe one of the more well-known things in the Bible that's used very explicitly by Jesus as a paradigm for salvation. Um, When Jesus fed the 5,000 out of um, a few loaves and fishes, uh, he said, I am the bread of heaven, the bread of life. Jesus wanted them to remember this paradigm from the Old Testament that just as bread fell every night and they collected in the morning, that's how they survived for 40 years in the desert. Millions probably of people living there. There's not enough cows and grain and all that growing there. God had to provide for them. And Jesus says, I'm that kind of bread. You have spiritual life because God has provided it to you. So Exodus is this paradigm of salvation in all these ways and actually many, many more. That's just a preview. So this is the kind of thing that we'll be looking at is how is Exodus the gospel, the good news for salvation in the Old Testament is because it points us to the greater reality in the New Testament. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way to the end, you will find repeated references all the way back to these kinds of things saying, remember. In fact, a couple weeks ago, um, I used out of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, remember how the people in the desert grumbled um, going to Laura's um, sermon? He says, don't be like that. Um, So even a negative example can come out of the Exodus. So we might ask this, why do we study Exodus? Well, first and foremost, because it is the gospel. But also, um, it meets some needs that we have. And we'll go quickly through this. We need to know God better. I hope that's a desire in your heart. That there's never a place. Some of us here have been walking with the Lord many, many years. And some of us may be new to walking with the Lord. None of us ever stop having the need to know more of God. And this is what Exodus says about God just in some general terms. He is the sovereign protector, provider, and redeemer. 
And we won't dive deeply into those, but just know first, he's sovereign, that he's in control. In Exodus, if you don't see anything else, you will know that God is always in control of what happens there. Even when it seems a foreign power, a wicked leader, are oppressing God's people, we're never led to believe that it's out of God's control. In fact, next week, in the very first chapter of Exodus, um, that leader tries to destroy um, the future of God's people And God says, no, 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 that's not how it's going to be. I have a future for my people. You are not in control. And so doing that, that we see that God is in control over all of creation, the great Nile River that was so important to the life in Egypt, the weather, storms, all are under God's control. And even people, the great and mighty Pharaoh and his armies are only Um, They are always at the mercy of God's sovereignty, his control. And even we'll see the gods, the false gods that the Egyptians worshipped are seen to be nothing when compared to the true and living God. And so I read this, I like this statement. Genesis ends with God arranging for salvation in Egypt. If you know that story, there's a famine in Israel and God sends by way of a a, a young man being sold into slavery and rising to power in Egypt. God's people are actually saved because Egypt rises to power. And then they turn and eventually Exodus tells us that God's people, having been saved in Egypt, now must be saved out of Egypt. Exodus wants us to remember that God is ultimately in control. And because he's in control, he is the protector. Even when we don't feel like God is protecting it. Think about these people that were slaves for almost 400 years probably thought God had abandoned them. In fact, I know they thought their future was done. And all they could do was cry out to God as they suffered in the midst of that. And yet we know that God's protection has never left these people. And God is the provider both for their freedom and even for daily needs. We need to know that. Jesus really is the bread that comes down out of heaven for our salvation, but also for every day. And on those days where you say, Jesus, help me. This is not a good day for me. Exodus will say, God is with you and he has provided for you. Not just in general terms, but specifically, he's provided the one who will set you free. And then again, this redeemer or savior um, is a big thing that God sends Moses because he knows his people need to be led out of captivity into freedom. It's God who does it, but chooses to use who really turns out to be a reluctant person in being that leader, um, points us to one who is greater than Moses, Jesus Christ. There's no reluctancy in Jesus leaving heaven, um, abdicating the throne for a time in order to suffer and die for our sins. He is the Redeemer and the Savior. So what do we look to for God? We need to know what Exodus says. He is the God. In chapter 18, Jethro, uh, who is Moses' father-in-law, says, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. That's what happened. And now he says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Exodus tells us there is no one like him. There is no challenger to the sovereignty of God. He and he alone is God. But then it goes so far as to say this. Not only is there a God or the God over all the world, he actually has entered into relationship with his special people in order that we can say he is my God. And when we gather, we can confidently say that he is our God. Chapter 6, verse 7 in Exodus says, I will take you, this is God speaking, to be my people. Now, if we just stop there, that's an incredible statement, isn't it? God looks at a people. um, There's not much to them at this point. There's been great promises made, but they're a nation of slaves 
without resources, without power, without even any basic freedoms. And he says, I'll take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so God is saying, I don't want you just to know that there is a God out there. I want you to know that I will be your God. You can benefit from those great and precious promises. And then finally, if there is the God and he chooses to be in relationship with a people, then we are to demonstrate that in belief in that God. Trust um, all the words we would use in that. Again, Exodus chapter 18, verse 30 and 31 says, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. This is at the end of that parting of the Red Sea. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. Now, if we stopped there, that's where many people in our world today stop in their acknowledgement of a God or the God. He's out there somewhere, and I can recognize that he's done incredible things. I can look at the grandeur of the mountains, the beauty of the sunset, stand at the vast ocean and overlook that and say, boy, there is somebody who did something special in creating all this. But notice what it says. The result of knowing the power of God should be this. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. See, that's God's calling. It's out of Exodus. It's out of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's out of the letters that Paul wrote to the church. It's out of the prophets and the Psalms is that knowing God should lead to believing in God. That's the essence of salvation. That's why Exodus is the gospel of the Old Testament. So we need to know God better. And in knowing God better, we believe and trust and even fear the Lord. Secondly, we need to understand God's redemption better. And I won't spend a bunch of time here. I'll remind you of this verse we've already read. Romans chapter 6, 17 and 18 says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin, and skipping down it says, have been set free from sin. That's what salvation does for us. In fact, in the book uh, to the Galatians that Paul writes that letter there, in the sixth chapter it starts with, for freedom God has set you free. God wants a free people, but free in order, in fact, this uh, verse in Romans closes with, and have become slaves of righteousness. We have a new master, but it's not a master of oppression and demands. It is a master who now gives great freedom, joy, and happiness. A people who are called in such relationship that they rejoice in their relationship with God. They worship this living God. So redemption is just that buying back, redeeming, getting, uh, it, it's really, I think I said um, last year in a series we were talking about, redemption is slave market language. It is one who has gone into and redeems us out of bondage, slavery, and oppression. Primarily spiritually, but there are, again, examples throughout the history of the world where God's people have been part of freeing of captives, both in a literal and a spiritual sense. So we need to understand God's redemption better, and it's this paradigm in Exodus that will help do that. And then finally, we need to understand God's mission and ours better. If God calls a people for himself, and the Bible tells us very clearly that he has, not just a nation in Israel, the New Testament points us to now God's people involve all the people of faith. It has nothing to do with our great, 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 great grandparents. It has to do with our brother, Jesus Christ, with our Father who is in heaven, who's adopted us into that family. And if God has done that, then he's done it for his own glory. God's mission is for, as we've already read in Exodus, that the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel. He calls us to himself to be in relationship with God so that people more and more will be drawn to that same relationship. And God does work physically uh, in, uh, to, for enslaved people that ultimately, though, that they could experience 
um, spiritual deliverance. And then I mentioned this just in passing already. If that's God's mission, is to call a people for himself, to give them freedom and salvation, how does he ordinarily accomplish that? Most of the time in the Bible, we see that he lets us be part of that. And he calls Moses at, uh, just in the very beginning of Exodus, when Moses is called to be part of that, he is reluctant. He doesn't think he's up to the task. In fact, at one point, he just says, I don't really want to do this. And God says, you can go and you can take my name and my power and my plans for the people. You don't do it in your strength. And so God's mission is our mission, but we don't do it according to our own power. We do it according to his. And it's interesting that when uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh, he says that the exodus will take place. He says these people will leave Egypt as free people. Quote in verse uh, chapter uh, 9, verse 16, it says, so that my name might be proclaimed to all the earth. So in Exodus, it says, I'm going to do this thing so that all the world will know that I am God and salvation and freedom comes through me. Notice how that parallels with the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. You see, just like God was always with his people, God was always accomplishing his salvation, and God was always proclaiming, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. He says to us today, I am the Lord your God who my own son has died for your sins. So Exodus is that paradigm for that salvation that we can draw many lessons out. When we go through um, the book of Exodus, we're going to um, look at how we can apply God's redemption. What he does in his people is also um, kind of a pattern for us to follow in taking care of vulnerable, the unborn, for children that are at risk. It addresses racism and murder, how God can use weak and ordinary people to accomplish amazing things. The importance of singing praise to this God. We're going to find a number of times God does some incredible kind of thing and the people stand there with their mouth open um, in awe of what God does and then almost inevitably what happens next, they break out in song. And if I was more musical, I would um, teach you a song I learned as a kid that's the song of Moses. After that Red Sea event, all the people are saved. Did anybody grow up singing this song? I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. The Lord my God, my strength, my song, and now he is my victory. That's Moses' song. That's our song, though. That the Lord is God and now he is our victory over sin and death. Exodus is the gospel of the Old Testament. It tells us that God has good news for captives. You can be set free by the living God and by his son, Jesus Christ. It tells us that God remembers his plans and his promises. Even when it seems that all hope might be lost, God is faithful. And finally, this good news. God is a rescuing God. He doesn't forget about us in our trials, our tribulations, and our pain, and our suffering, that God comes and provides all that we need, both our freedom, our ability to worship, and our ability to obey and serve the living God. That's the good news of the gospel. It's found in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I hope you will enjoy uh, this time as we look into God's Word um, for the next few weeks or months. Um, we'll find why Exodus is the gospel in the Old Testament. It's good news today. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you are a living God. You are almighty God. You are awesome and powerful, and yet you are loving, gracious, and merciful. I pray that uh, we all uh, who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can rejoice over and over again for the freedom that we experience. We've been set free from the slavery of sin. So I pray that as we walk in newness of life, we would know you better and better every day, that you are a sovereign God who protects and provides and redeems a people for yourself. 
But I also pray that uh, we would know you in such a way that we could walk in that newness of life, that we would know what it is to love God and to serve God and to follow after him. Uh, And even as importantly, we would know how to love one another and live in the kind of freedom that you've given to us. Um, So as we uh, continue to be... uh, Uh, worked on by your Holy Spirit through your word, we will look for those things to be accomplished in us this day and every day. So we are grateful and thankful and we pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.